and could not fault their enthusiasm. They often referred to themselves as the diggers, a term originating from the gold rushes in Australia of a hundred years earlier. When Britain went to war against Nazi Germany in September 1939, her whole empire loyally followed her. From countries all over the world, men and women were taken to fight many thousands of miles from their homes for a land which they had never visited against enemies about whom they knew little. But none of them ever queried the reasons for doing so and none proved more steadfast and gallant than the troops from two of the most remote outposts of the empire, Australia and New Zealand. Few countries contributed more proportionately, their small populations providing a ready supply of men who swiftly gained a worldwide reputation, not only as superb fighting troops, but as rugged individualists. The story of the Anzacs, as these gladiators became known, is one of the least told, but most stirring, of World War II. A quarter of a century earlier, when Britain declared war on Germany and Austro-Hungary in 1914, Australia and New Zealand had only recently become self-governing nations. Australia in 1901, New Zealand six years later. Both immediately sent units to fight in Europe, and against Turkey, which had joined the Central Powers. In Egypt, they were formed into an Australian and New Zealand Army Corps, from which came the nickname Anzacs. During the Gallipoli campaign in 1915, the Anzacs fought as national units for the first time in their history. This searing experience first gave Australia and New Zealand a sense of their own identity as independent countries. The Anzacs then fought on the Western Front in France and Flanders. There they played a leading part in the final victories that ended the war in November 1918. Other Anzacs fought in Palestine forming the main part of the Desert Mounted Corps. Their dramatic breakthroughs and advances helped to shatter the Turkish defences. The memory of what the Anzacs had endured at Gallipoli during 1915 became a fundamental part of the identity of both countries as proudly independent nations. Australia and New Zealand were just as ready to help Britain in 1939 as they had been in 1914. Each offered to send a division of troops to take part in the war in Europe. But it took time to build up and train their small peacetime forces for war. Many of the men recruited were well used to a hard and rigorous life in the outback or mountains and made natural soldiers, although their attitude to traditional military discipline often left much to be desired. The 6th Australian Division eventually sailed in January 1940. Its men landed in Egypt, as their fathers had done 25 years earlier. 
But this time the threat came not from Turkey, but from Mussolini's Italy, with its colonies in neighboring Libya and Abyssinia. When the Australians arrived, Italy had not yet declared war, so the division was able to continue its training, and it was soon joined by the New Zealand division. This was commanded by General Bernard Freiburg, who had won the Victoria Cross during World War I. Most of his troops stayed with the Australians in Egypt, but one brigade was sent on to strengthen the forces defending Britain against German invasion. The relaxed attitude of the Anzacs to military discipline quickly made them notorious. But the more hidebound British Army High Command could not fault their enthusiasm. They often referred to themselves as the Diggers, a term originating from the gold rushes in Australia of a hundred years earlier. New Zealand's small population of barely two million meant that the mobilization of a complete division stretched her resources to the limit. Whereas during the summer of 1940, the Australians were able to form another two divisions for home defence and send sufficient troops to the Middle East to form a second division there. The 9th Australian Division came into being in Palestine at the end of the year. In June 1940, Mussolini finally brought Italy into the war and the Middle East became an active theatre. The Anzacs did not take part in the early battles, as the Italians advanced cautiously into Egypt, and were then pushed back in early December 1940 by a British counterattack led by the Desert Rats of the 7th Armoured Division and the 4th Indian Division. But during a lull in the battle in mid-December, the 6th Australian Division moved forward to relieve the Indians who were being redeployed to East Africa. The Anzacs were about to have their first taste of combat. The troops of the 6th Australian Division moved forward to begin the next stage of the British assault on the Italians at the beginning of January 1941. Their first task was to capture the Italian-held port of Badi, just inside Libya. After a two-day battle in which 38,000 Italians surrendered, they entered it on the 5th of January. Their next objective was Tobruk, a further 90 miles along the coast. This fell on the 22nd, and the Australians then pushed a further 300 miles towards Benghazi, while the 7th Armoured Division thrust inland across the Cyrenaican bulge to cut off the retreating Italians. Within a fortnight, a further 20,000 men 200 guns and 120 tanks fell into British and Australian hands. It was the first Allied ground victory of World War II, and the Anzacs had played a key role, but the euphoria did not last long. Within a week of this victory, Erwin Rommel and his German Africa Corps began to land at the Libyan port of Tripoli. While Rommel prepared to attack, 6th Australian Division was relieved by 9th Australia. But the 6th had little time to rest, for British Prime Minister Winston Churchill decided to send troops from the Middle East to support the Greeks, who had been fighting an Italian invasion from Albania since the previous November. Sixth Australian Division and the New Zealand Division, now rejoined by the brigade which had gone to Britain in 1940, formed part of the force. 
Hitler, keen to secure his southern Balkan flank for his projected invasion of the Soviet Union, invaded both Greece and Yugoslavia on the 6th of April. The Anzacs fought bravely, but could not hold back the German blitzkrieg. Yet they were by no means demoralized, as New Zealander Lieutenant Charles Upham, in peacetime a sheep farmer, told a BBC interviewer. The division over here is growing from strength to strength, and the morale of our own troops is unsurpassed. You will hear more from us again. The Royal Navy evacuated the British force, and part of the Anzacs went back to Egypt they would soon have the opportunity to gain revenge. The remainder of the Anzacs was sent to the eastern Mediterranean island of Crete, which was the obvious next target for the Germans. Bernard Freiburg, the commander of the New Zealand division, was put in charge of the island's defenses and was convinced that the main attack would be from the sea. In reality, the Germans were planning a revolutionary airborne assault, which completely wrong-footed the British and Dominion forces. They were dispersed along the northern coastline of the island, and unable to concentrate quickly enough when the German tactics became apparent. German air supremacy proved crucial, and once the paratroops had secured an airfield and could land reinforcements, the issue was no longer in doubt, despite gallant resistance by the defenders. By the end of May, the Germans had secured the island, and the Royal Navy was forced to carry out yet another evacuation. During the fighting on Crete, Charles Upham, weakened by dysentery, destroyed a number of machine gun posts, almost single-handedly extricated a company that had been cut off and repulsed numerous German attacks. He was awarded a well-deserved Victoria Cross. The disaster on Crete, following that in Greece, might have made lesser troops believe that the Germans were unstoppable. But not the Anzacs. Do you see this? Good old Gertie. I dragged her 150 miles back to the coast. But did you use her? I'll say I did. But give old Jerry hell with it. Yes. We're looking forward to our next date with him too. Just let me have another crack at them. That's all I'm waiting for. The sooner we get at them again, the sooner we'll be home. We'll give them all the works next time. And we certainly made a mess of them this time they would soon have their opportunity. For while Greece was collapsing, Rommel had attacked in Libya and driven the British pell-mell back into Egypt. During the retreat, General Leslie Morshead, commander of the 9th Australian Division, was ordered to hold the port of Tobruk at all costs. Morshead had some 31,000 troops, including his own division, a brigade from 7th Australian Division and a British Armoured Brigade. By the 11th of April, Tobruk was totally cut off. It was subjected to sustained Axis air attack, which threatened to cut off all supplies. Then, on the 14th of April, Rommel launched a major assault against the port. Axis forces succeeded in getting inside the Australian positions. A series of desperate battles followed and the Germans were eventually driven out. 
during the fighting, Corporal John Edmondson of the Australian 2nd 17th Battalion won a Victoria Cross for holding his position despite being severely wounded. Edmondson died of his wounds and his posthumous award, the first of 20 to be won by Australians during the war, was received by his parents. The siege of Tobruk continued throughout the summer of 1941. The beleaguered garrison even produced its own newspaper, which did much to maintain morale. Despite the constant Axis air attacks, the Royal Navy did manage to keep the garrison supplied and evacuate sick and wounded back to Egypt. The Australians proudly nicknamed themselves the Rats of Tobruk. Many lived in caves, conveniently situated close to the front line. They kept the Axis forces at bay by dominating no man's land through aggressive patrolling. For the Allies, the Rats of Tobruk provided a beacon of hope at a desperate period in the war. The scope of the fighting in the Middle East widened during summer 1941, and the Anzacs became involved in another campaign. Fears that the Luftwaffe was about to begin operating from Vichy French airfields in Syria caused the British to invade the territory in June 1941. Among the troops taking part was 7th Australian Division and elements of the 6th Division. Australian General John Laverack was in overall command. He led the Australians, together with free French troops and units from the British 1st Cavalry Division, in an advance up the coastal plain. The Vichy French put up more resistance than expected and there was some hard fighting. Nevertheless, the overstretched Allied force pushed forward. The Australians took Damascus and then advanced towards Beirut. They occupied the Lebanese capital just as hostilities ended. Among the heroes of the campaign was Australian artilleryman Lieutenant Arthur Roden Cutler, who lost a leg during heavy fighting. For several individual acts of bravery, he won a VC. Despite the eventual Allied success in Syria, the siege of Tobruk remained the main focus of attention. Even though the rats of Tobruk showed no sign of cracking under the strain, the Australian government was becoming concerned that its troops were bearing too great a burden of the fighting. General Sir Claude Auchinleck, the Commander-in-Chief Middle East, was obliged to begin replacing the garrison. In August 1941, the Australian 18th Brigade was relieved by the Free Polish Carpathian Brigade. The relief continued into the autumn, but one Australian battalion would remain in Tobruk until the very end. Auchinleck was also preparing an offensive designed to drive Rommel back and relieve Tobruk. He launched Operation Crusader on the 18th of November. The New Zealand Division, supported by a British tank brigade, was given the crucial role of linking up with the Tobruk garrison, which had been given orders to break out. 
New Zealanders faced stubborn Axis resistance. But after eight days fighting, they linked up with some of the troops from Tobruk at El Duda, 20 miles southeast of the port. The New Zealanders now had to withstand a series of furious attacks designed to drive them away from Tobruk. Eventually, the division was cut in two by 15th Panzer Division and forced to withdraw, but not before it had made a significant contribution to wearing down the Axis forces. Within a week, Rommel had withdrawn from Tobruk, and by early January, the British were once more in control of Cyrenaic, having inflicted heavy casualties on the Axis forces. But by this time, there had been developments elsewhere, which were to have a dramatic effect on the future of the Australian and New Zealand forces in the Middle East. On the 7th of December, 1941, the war came closer to the Anzac's homelands, as Japanese carrier-borne aircraft made a surprise attack on the US Pacific Fleet base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. This finally brought the United States into the war, much to the relief of the British. But the conflict now took a grim turn for the Allies. For the Japanese launched immediate invasions of Malaya and the Philippines, as well as US Pacific Islands. Now that the war had suddenly reached their doorsteps, the Australian and New Zealand governments requested the return of their troops from the Middle East. It was the Japanese invasion of Malaya which especially worried Australia. And this concern grew rapidly as the Japanese advanced swiftly down the peninsula. A complete Australian division, the 8th, had been deployed to Malaya earlier in the year, clearly showing how important the territory was reckoned to be for the defence of the Australian homeland. Two Indian divisions covered northern Malaya, while the Australians, under General Henry Gordon Bennett, were responsible for the south. The Japanese were soon driving the Indian troops back. The British High Command had no answer to their use of outflanking moves through the jungle. By mid-January, Gordon Bennett's men were in action, but could not stop the Japanese onrush. At the end of the month, the British forces withdrew to Singapore Island. Two weeks later, it was all over. The British and Dominion troops were forced into an ignominious surrender. The vast majority of the Australians, together with their fellow British and Indian soldiers, went into captivity. They now faced over three and a half years of Japanese brutality. But one man who did escape was General Gordon Bennett, who believed that his experience in fighting the Japanese would be of value in the future. His fellow countrymen thought differently. 
believing that he should have gone into captivity with his men. Gordon Bennett never held another active command. The fall of Singapore presented a direct Japanese threat to Australia, and this was reinforced by an air attack on Darwin on the 19th of February, 1942, four days after the surrender of Singapore. The fear that Australia was about to be invaded grew rapidly, and the government renewed its request for the troops in the Middle East to be sent back. The 6th and 7th Australian divisions returned in March. Their families were overjoyed to see them again, but it would not be long before they were parted once more. The 9th Australian and the New Zealand divisions remained in the Middle East, but only because the Americans had agreed to send troops to Australia. These began to arrive in April 1942. A detachment of 7th Australian division was immediately sent to Java in the Dutch East Indies, but the Japanese onrush overwhelmed it and other allied forces in the region. Many Australians refused to surrender and with the help of the local people began to wage a guerrilla campaign against the Japanese occupiers. The focus of the Japanese assault now switched to New Guinea with landings being made at Ley and Salamaua in early March 1942. These were accompanied by air attacks on Port Moresby on the southwest coast and further bombing raids against Darwin. At the end of March, the Australian government began a total denial policy in the northern part of the country. Nothing of value was to be allowed to fall into Japanese hands, should they invade, and a vast migration of sheep and cattle was got underway. American General Douglas MacArthur, who had been ordered by President Roosevelt to leave the beleaguered Philippines, arrived in Australia and became the supreme Allied commander, Southwest Pacific. Australian General Thomas Blamey was appointed the land force commander. The ultimate Japanese objective in Papua New Guinea was the capital Port Moresby, which they planned to seize by an amphibious assault. But this meant that they must bring back their carriers, which had been sent to the Indian Ocean to harry the British. While these were returning, the Japanese continued to occupy the western part of the island, while their Port Moresby invasion force sailed from Rabaul in New Britain on the 4th of May, 1942. Forewarned of this by their codebreakers, the United States sent a carrier force to intercept the Japanese in the Coral Sea. In the ensuing battle, the Americans had a carrier disabled, while the Japanese lost one carrier sunk and another crippled. It was enough to force the Japanese to cancel the amphibious attack on Port Moresby. But still determined to capture it, they decided on an overland advance along the Kokoda Trail which cuts through the precipitous Owen Stanley Mountains from Buna on the north coast. The only forces facing them were a partially trained Australian militia battalion and some local Papuan troops. Fighting desperately in the harshest conditions, the Australians were steadily driven back. As General Blamey later explained, both sides had underestimated the terrain. He thought it was easier than this going over the mountains than he'd realised. I don't think he, I don't think anybody re could realise what these uh, Owen Stanleys were like, unless they'd walked them. You stand up there and you look right down 
what the troops called the golden steers that tips cut in the, in, the, in the hillside and you see them going up on the other side and then you have a succession of, uh, of uh, steep hillsides to go down and up and it's terribly hard going. Many men were driven off the trail by Japanese ambushes and outflanking moves and died lonely deaths in the jungle. The remainder continued to fight on. Heroically, the militia battalion never lost its cohesion, even though its men were racked with disease, wounds and exhaustion. The lives of many were saved solely through the dedication of their Papuan porters. Even though the militia were reinforced by two further battalions, the Australians continued to be pushed back. On the 10th of September, the Japanese captured the Yorobaiwa Ridge, just 40 miles from Port Moresby. But here, the resolute Australian defence prevented them from advancing any further. Meanwhile, intelligence sources warned MacArthur of an impending Japanese landing at Milne Bay. The Australian 18th Brigade was sent there and quickly forced the Japanese to withdraw. By now, the Japanese on the Kokoda Trail were suffering from disease and overstretched supply lines and began falling back. Some had been reduced to such a state that they even surrendered, something which the Japanese military code viewed as a disgraceful act. The Australians followed up and found themselves engaged in another exhausting campaign, clashing frequently with determined Japanese rearguards. Despite the terrain being against them, they steadily pushed their fanatical enemy back. Meanwhile, US troops had been landed near Buna and drove the Japanese away from their base at the northern end of the Kokoda Trail. It was not until the second half of January 1943 that the Japanese were finally cleared from Papua New Guinea. Over 2,000 Australians were killed or wounded during this toughest of campaigns, and some 9,300 went down with malaria and other diseases. While the Australians were fighting back in New Guinea, US Marines had landed on Japanese-held Guadalcanal in the Solomons in August 1942. It took six months of desperate fighting on Guadalcanal before the Americans were securely established in the Solomon Islands. And their success made the Japanese even more determined to hold on to New Guinea and the rest of the Solomons. In June 1943, Supreme Allied Commander General Douglas MacArthur set in motion Operation Cartwheel. Its ultimate aim was to isolate the main Japanese base in the southwest Pacific, Rabaul. A major strand of the plan was landings along the coast of Papua New Guinea. First, US and Australian aircraft had to gain air supremacy over the region. Then, 9th Australian Division fresh from being refitted and meeting the jungle for the first time after its long campaign in the Middle East, landed east of Leh. 
simultaneously, American paratroops secured the airstrip at Nadza. The 7th Australian Division was airlifted in. It then advanced north and, with 9th Australian Division moving southwards, caught the Japanese in a pincer movement, forcing them to evacuate both Ley and Salamaua. One of the first diggers into Ley described the devastation for the BBC. But so complete was the rout of the vaunted Japanese that all the damage was inflicted by the Allies. There was no scorched earth policy if we accept scorched rice and fish which the demoralized rabble left in huge cooking pots over burning fires. American bombing and Australian shells caused the damage. From Heath's plantation, seven and a half miles west of Ley, right to the waterfront, the terrible havoc of heavy bombardment was everywhere. After this success, the Australians, together with US forces, carried out further amphibious landings along the New Guinea coast, constantly cutting off Japanese forces. New Zealand had now formed a second division, confusingly numbered the third, and this began operating in the Southwest Pacific. During the latter half of 1943, it took part in seizing a number of islands from the Japanese, including Vela La Vela, the Treasuries, and Green Island. As the war in the Pacific swung decisively in favor of the Allies, and the Anzacs played a major role in the southwestern theater of war, the forces that had remained in the Middle East had been through equally dramatic times. During the first half of 1942, just as the Allied forces were suffering catastrophic defeats in the Pacific, the Anzacs fighting in the desert also seemed about to be involved in another disaster. For Rommel had once more surged forward and driven the British back into Egypt. For a time it looked as if nothing could stop the Axis forces from reaching the Suez Canal. The British had constructed a defense line at El Alamein, from the Mediterranean coast in the north to the virtually impassable Katara Depression in the south. The New Zealand division was in the thick of the desperate battles that raged here for most of July 1942. Charles Upham, who had won a Victoria Cross on Crete in May 1941, was now commanding an infantry company on the Ruesat Ridge. During bitter fighting there, he was wounded no less than four times, but continued to lead his men with great determination. In the end, his position was overrun by superior German forces, and Upham was captured. While he was in prison camp, he learned that he had won a second VC, to become only the third man who has done so in the history of one of the world's most prestigious decorations for bravery. In August 1942, the British Eighth Army received a new commander, General Bernard Montgomery. In October, he went on to the offensive against Rommel at El Alamein. Both the remaining Australian division in the Middle East, the Ninth, and the New Zealand division fought with great tenacity during the bruising 10-day battle which finally forced the Axis forces to retreat. But after this, their ways parted. The Australians were withdrawn to refit and in February 1943 returned home to boost their country's forces in the Southwest Pacific. The New Zealand division fought on in the desert as one of the leading formations in the pursuit of Rommel across Libya. When they reached the capital, Tripoli, Prime Minister Winston Churchill came to congratulate them. 
he addressed the division and paid them a very special tribute. And we of the British Isles, our hearts go out in gratitude to the people of New Zealand who have sent this splendid division to win glory across the ocean. <laughs> The New Zealanders went on to fight gallantly during the campaign in Tunisia, and the 28th Maori Battalion performed outstandingly during the Battle of Marath in March 1943. Montgomery tried and failed to break through the main Axis defence line in a series of night assaults. So he then sent the New Zealanders on a wide outflanking move through the Tabaga Gap. The Germans were quick to react, and the Maoris fought a desperate battle to keep the gap open against furious counterattacks. Twenty-five-year-old Lieutenant Mao Nui Akiwi Ngarimu and his platoon held a key position for 24 hours. He won a posthumous VC for single-handedly breaking up an enemy attack by charging at the advancing Germans. The New Zealanders took part in the final defeat of the Axis forces in Tunisia in May 1943 and were then withdrawn to refit. Now called 2nd New Zealand Division, and still under the command of Bernard Freiburg, they remained in the Mediterranean and went on with the 8th Army to Italy. There, the division took part in the grim battles for Monte Cassino in early 1944 as the Allies tried to penetrate the formidable German defences of the Gustav Line in the mountains south of Rome. Once more, the tenacity of the Kiwis was tested to the limit, but their fighting spirit remained as high as ever. The New Zealanders then took part in the advance up the eastern side of Italy and were involved in the breaking of the final main German defensive position, the Gothic Line, in April 1945. The division liberated the historic Italian city of Padua and finished the war in Trieste at the head of the Adriatic. Since autumn 1942, they had advanced over 2,000 miles across North Africa and up through Italy, with Bernard Freiburg still at their head. While the second New Zealand division was playing a major role in the Mediterranean theater, many thousands of miles away, other Anzac troops were also marching towards victory. During 1944, Australian forces relieved the US troops on New Britain and Bougainville in the Northern Solomons, so that the latter could take part in the campaign in the Philippines. And in the summer of 1945, Australian forces were committed to the liberation of Borneo in the Dutch East Indies. The 7th Australian Division landed on Tarakan Island off the Borneo coast on the 1st of May. Japanese resistance remained bitter, and not until June was the island secured. Further Australian forces liberated Brunei. And then, in July 1945, came the final major Anzac operation of the war, the landings at Balikpapan on Borneo's east coast by 7th Australian Division. They quickly closed on the port and secured it after a final fierce battle with the Japanese. 
the Anzacs' long war was virtually at an end. But there was still work to do, for after the Japanese surrender, both Australian and New Zealand contingents took part in the Allied occupation of Japan. It was a fitting recognition of the courage the Anzacs had shown during almost six years of combat. But amid the triumph, it should never be forgotten that for more than three years, other Australians had had to show courage of a different kind. These were the men who had been captured by the Japanese during the dark days of early 1942. They had endured unspeakable horrors, but those who survived never allowed their spirit to be broken. Their homecoming, after all they had been through, had a special poignancy. The contribution made by the Anzacs to ultimate victory in World War II had been out of all proportion to the size of the populations of Australia and New Zealand. The cost had been equally high. Australian troops suffered over 40,000 casualties, with nearly 23,000 killed. New Zealand had 22,000 killed and wounded. In some of the most demanding campaigns of World War II, the Anzacs had demonstrated the qualities that make them amongst the foremost gladiators in the history of warfare. 